you have your Bibles this morning, we want to invite your attention to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we will be examining verses 22 and 23 for just a moment. So good to see each of you here this morning, especially those of you who are visiting with us. We always want you to know that you're our honored guest, and we hope that you'll come back and be with us here at the South Haven Church of Christ at any opportunities that you have. We will be coming back tonight and meeting at 6 p.m., and we'll be studying about the three bears, uh, not Goldilocks and the three bears, but we're going to be talking about another set of three bears later on this evening. I appreciate Russell's prayer. He prayed for Wade preaching this morning. I hope that prayer will stretch just a little bit. Uh, you've got to put up with me today. And so uh, if you would, just bear with me for the next half hour or so, and we will uh, we'll make our way through it. But hopefully that prayer will stretch just a little bit more uh, towards, uh, towards the Word of God this morning. Perhaps the saddest phrase in all of the English language has to be, there is no hope. And the reason why this phrase it must be one of the saddest is because of the feelings that it leaves us with. You know, it leaves us with the feelings of, of despair and desperation. It leaves us with those feelings of discouragement, but ultimately a sense of helplessness as well. It, it leaves us in a sense of helplessness towards an individual or possibly to a situation. But one thing that you and I need to understand is that if we are faithful children of God, we have hope. And that is so important for you and I to remember as Christians is that we have hope and that our salvation can rely on that great hope that the Lord provides for us. Recently, I was reading a bulletin article, and I don't remember the content of the article, but I remember what the title of this article was. And it said, if I had one last sermon to preach. And I started to think about that, if I just had one more sermon to preach, what would it be? And there were a number of thoughts that I came up with. I think it would even be a, a good plan for a series if there were just one more sermon that we could preach. If there were just one more sermon that we could hear, what would it be? Well, this morning, there's one last sermon that just kept coming to my mind. If this were my last, which I hope it isn't. But I thought of six things in regards to salvation and why is salvation so important. Now normally I don't preach using six points. There's generally three or four max. This morning we're going to look at six, but we're going to, Lord willing, be moving through those fairly quickly. Why is salvation so important? Number one, it's because life is short. When you and I think about life, it's fleeting. Life is something that is extremely brief when you really think about time. And when you think about time, our existence that's here on this earth really isn't that long. When we think about life, life was never designed to be something that was permanent. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to begin here at verses 22 and 23... Uh, I want to read the passage first and then go back and, and let's put it under a microscope for just a moment. He says, "...being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of the flower of grass, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away." The first thing that he mentions here, he says, not being born again of corruptible seed, but one that is incorruptible. He's talking about something here when he uses that word corruptible. He's talking about something that isn't perfect. He's talking about something that is only temporary. And what we have to understand about this life is that's what it is. It's something that is simply temporary. But then notice some of the words that he begins to use in the context to further explain this point. He says, for all flesh is as grass. Now here he's talking about something that is seasonal. Grass is something that is seasonal. I, I don't know if you've noticed here lately, I'm sure that you have, 
but your grass is probably growing a whole lot, isn't it? If your grass is anything like mine, we have Bermuda grass at our house, and there's two things that Bermuda grass absolutely loves. It loves heat, and it loves water. And guess what? That grass is growing pretty quickly right now. But that grass, it's something that's only seasonal. And when he talks about life, he's talking about life being like grass. It's something that's just seasonal. It's something that's not designed to be permanent. Well, let's continue on. And the glory of man as the flower of grass. You know, that word flower there, it is the most short-lived part of a plant. When a flower blooms, that is the shortest living part of a plant. And here he talks about the glory of man being the flower of the grass. I suppose if we wanted to, we could take that glory being the prime years of a human. But the bottom line is, it's still getting on the point that that flower, it only blooms for a short period of time. It's only temporary. But then watch the end result. The grass with You know, when it gets to September, the latter part of September, early part of October... And those temperatures begin to change. Guess what happens to that grass? It starts to wither away. It starts to die. And that's why. It's just here for a season. It's just short, especially in view of eternity. And the flower thereof falleth away. Eventually, when that flower blooms, what's going to happen to those petals? Eventually, they're going to fall off. And that's the design of life. Life is short. So we have corruptible, we have grass, we have flowers, we have withering, and we have falling. If you would, for a moment, turn over to James chapter 4, verse 14. And in James 4, verse 14, the, the question is going to be asked, you're familiar with this passage, for what is life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. That word vapor there is a word that you and I are accustomed to, especially in the kitchen. Those of you that have ever done any cooking or any boiling of water, things of that nature, you know that there's going to be water that's going to vaporize. And that water, you're going to be able to see it in, in the air. The vapor is in the air. When you turn those burners off, what happens to those vapors? They're here one minute, and they're gone the next. And that's what James describes in regards to life. In Job 14 and verse 1, he said, Man that is born of woman is of many days and full of trouble. Is that right? James, man that is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. And so we see the timelines from these passages. We understand that life isn't something that was ever designed to be permanent. As much as we try to use the various supplies that are on the markets today to keep us as young as possible, to keep us from aging as, as much as possible, to enhance and to keep this life going and try to as it always has, It's only putting off the inevitable, that life is brief, that life is short. When we consider life for just a moment and the brevity of it, it makes salvation that much more significant. When we start to understand how short life is, it makes salvation that much more important to us. When we turn over to 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul tells us that now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Sometimes we sing the song, Today is the day of salvation. And we put the finishing words on there, Tomorrow may be too late. Are you a child of God today? If not, we want to plead with you, don't put it off any longer. Life is short. And it makes salvation that much more important. Perhaps you're here today and you are a child of God, but you may be looking at your life, I'm not as faithful as I once was. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day 
to take the opportunity and make your life right through repentance, 1 John 1, verses 6 through 9. Life is short. We need to make sure we don't let it pass us by. But let's move on to a second point. Salvation is important because sin is seductive. Sin is seductive. When we think about this word seductive, it carries with it the idea of alluring. It carries with it the idea of something that is tempting. Now there are some things that may be alluring to us, some things that are tempting to us that are completely innocent, that there is nothing wrong with those things whatsoever if we keep them in a proper perspective. Let me give you a couple of ideas here. Perhaps there is a financial decision that you're thinking about making in regards to your family's finances. And you may be tempted by this offer over here. You may be <clears throat> tempted by this offer over here. You may say, you know, that's, that's pretty tempting. It could be that there's a job offer. Job offers, they come and they go, and, and sometimes we, we sit down. This is one that's extremely tempting. I don't know that I can pass it by. Have you ever ate at a restaurant before and perhaps you're trying to cut back a little bit, maybe you're on a diet, and you start looking down through the menu, and that is tempting right there. That is so tempting. Or maybe you're looking over at the desserts, uh, that, that chocolate cake over there, that is so tempting. And then you close the menu so that you don't have to look at it anymore. But then there are some things that aren't quite... As innocent. There are some things that tempt us and they have terrible consequences to them. And sin is one of those things. Sin has terrible consequences. Romans 6, verse 23. Romans 3, verse 23. And when we consider this idea of sin, there are individuals in the Scriptures that we can consider that that failed to those consequences, but others, they met the challenge and they avoided those consequences by turning away the temptations when they came. A couple of weeks ago, we studied about the life of Moses during our lectureship. And Hebrews 11, 24 and 25 was a passage that we studied about one evening. And this passage was gone into depth by our speaker, did an excellent job on it. But he talked about how Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh daughter. There were numerous attachments that Moses could have been and had a part of numerous advantages that he could have had by being acknowledged as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But the text tells us that he chose rather to suffer with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for how long? For a season. You see, he knew that, that sin has its pleasures but he also knew that it was for season. He knew that it had its pleasures, but he also knew about the consequences that went with those sins as well. When we consider the Scriptures, we look over at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. Paul tells us that, that God has provided a way of escape when we're tempted. And there have been some that we read about, they found that way of escape. Moses was one of those who found the way of escape. We can turn back and we can see that, that Joseph found the way of escape. We can turn back and, and we can notice that Jesus found the way of escape, Matthew chapter 4. But there were others that we read about, they weren't quite as fortunate. That they didn't seem to find the way of escape when it came their way. The first couple we read about in the Scriptures, Adam and Eve, didn't find the way of escape. And they had to pay for the consequences of their sin. David didn't find the way of escape. Samson didn't find the way of escape. Some of these had some lifelong consequences to pay. Others of them paid the consequences for a short period, but nonetheless, they paid for those consequences because of their actions. Someone once said that sin has one road, but three lanes to it. It has one road that's leading to destruction, Matthew 7, 13, and 14, but it has three lanes that are going down this road. 
you look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, we see those three lanes. There's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But brethren and friends, what you and I need to remember is Jesus offers a better way. And that's what makes salvation so important is because our Lord has provided a greater way for us. Matthew seven thirteen and 14 and John 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. In the third place this morning, salvation is so important because death is a sure thing. Death is a sure thing. You turn to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, we're going to read about an appointment. Benjamin Franklin once said that there are two things in life that are guaranteed. He said, it's death and taxes. In Hebrews 9 and verse 27, the Bible tells us that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. There is an appointment, it's a divine appointment that God has given to us. Now, there's an appointed time, but we don't know the arrival of that time. When we consider this appointment that's given here, each person, it, their life is going to end unless the Lord returns first. Another thing that we can take note concerning this verse is there's one life, and there's how many deaths? There's one death. Now, I don't know how long my life is going to last. You don't know how long your life is going to last. You don't know how you're going to die. You don't know when you're going to die. You don't know why you're going to die. You don't know where you're going to die. But there's an appointment that we all must keep. An appointment that's going to happen at some point in our life. And when death comes, that death is not a respecter of persons. You see, it comes to those who, who, uh, uh, who are wealthy. It comes to those who are poor. It doesn't respect any individual skin color. It doesn't affect anyone's nationality. It doesn't affect one's gender because all are going to face it one day. If you turn back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, the Bible talks about how our flesh is like, well, it comes from the dust of the earth. And this flesh, when we die, it's going to go back to the dust of the earth from where it came. In Psalm 90 and verse 10, the psalmist talks about how if, if we're, that, that life, let me back up there, that life is around 70 years, Lord willing. And if we're blessed, it could be around 80 years. But then, what's he tell us? What's he tell us about life? He tells us that it soon will be cut off. And what happens? We fly away. In Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5, Solomon said, Those who are living know that one day they're going to die. Now why talk about this? Because when we understand that death is a sure thing, it makes salvation that much more important to us. Knowing that we're going to leave this life, knowing that eternity is waiting. And we have a choice in the matter where we want to be in eternity. We can be in eternity with God or we can be in eternity with the devil and with his angels. Knowing that we only have one life and one death makes salvation that much more important. Then in the fourth place, salvation is so important because hell is severe. Because hell is severe. In the Scriptures, we have numerous descriptions of this terrible place. We have it described in, in several different ways and ways that we could choose this morning. But we're only going to look at basically two different ways that it's described. One of those descriptions that God gives for us is the description of hell. I mean, of fire. When we think about fire for a moment, you know, everybody's noticed that it's been pretty hot outside this past week, haven't it? This past week, there's been 100 plus degree temperatures on more than three occasions. I think they call it the heat wave. Last night, one of the newscasters, one of the weathermen said that we're in the dog days of summer right now. 
But as hot as it is outside, it's nothing in comparison to what hell is going to be like. See, when the Bible talks about hell, he talks about it as fire. We read in Matthew chapter 5 that he describes it as hellfire. Matthew chapter 13 talks about it as a furnace of fire. Matthew chapter 18 talks about it as an everlasting fire. And then in Matthew chapter 3, we read about an unquenchable fire. The hottest word that we can think of in our English language today, that's the word that God chose to use to describe this terrible place. But then, you think about the people that are described there. If you would, turn over to Revelation chapter 21. Let's look at verse 8 for just a moment. Revelation 21, verse 8. John says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 gives us another description of the individuals that will be there. A little bit larger group that's there. When you think about the people that are going to be there, I want you to imagine something with me. And the only way that I can do it is imagine it. I've never been there before. I have no idea what it's like. And I hope I never have to go unless I'm just visiting. But I want you to think about spending one night in jail. Just one night in jail. Not talking about prison here, but one night in jail. And most of the time when we see it on TV, when we see an individual spending one night in lockup, they, they most of the time don't have a cell to themselves, don't they? Generally speaking, they are in there with all the other people that have been locked up that night. I want you to think about just spending one evening with some of the worst criminals that you can think of. I don't know that I would sleep that night, would you? I, I think I would be over here in the farthest corner paying attention to every single surrounding that's going on, but just one night. But imagine having to spend all of eternity with those people that are described in here Revelation 21, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Those, those criminals. Those individuals that never make the changes that are needed to be made to spend eternity with God. Think about spending all eternity with them. In the hottest place that we could ever imagine. Where there's weeping and there's gnashing of teeth and there's outer darkness. I can't imagine what that would be like. I don't want to be anywhere near it. And that's what makes salvation that much more important. Number five, salvation is so important because heaven is supreme. When you think about the best place that you've ever been here on this earth, the most beautiful place that you've been to here on this earth, oftentimes you, you think about that on those bad days. Oftentimes you think about going back to that happy place. When you think about that happy place, I want you to think also about a place that has no fear. No sorrows, no death, no discomforts, no discouragements. There's not any sadness. That place we read about in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5, that place is called heaven. Jesus talks about it in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you unto myself, but there you may be also. When you consider heaven, it's the best part of everything. The best part of salvation, knowing that we get to be there, knowing that we get to be there with God. Because of the descriptions that we have concerning it, it makes salvation that much more important. Our final point this morning. 
Salvation is so important because of the sacrifice of Jesus. The sacrifice of our Lord. When you and I consider the sacrifice of our Lord, Jesus didn't deserve to be there. We read in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, But God commendeth, He demonstrated His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't deserve to go to the cross. But He did it so that you and I could be saved from our sins. He shed His blood. He sacrificed His life because He did it for the greater good. He understood the whole entire plan of God, the scheme of redemption. But then He did it also for our advantage, for our benefit. He became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey Him. When you and I consider salvation, Salvation is so important because life is short. Salvation is so important because death is certain. It's so important because sin is seductive, because hell is terrible, it's severe. It's so important because heaven is supreme and because Christ paid that sacrifice for us. You know, if we make the choice not to be washed in the blood, we make that sacri- we make His sacrifice look vain. We make it seem useless. Jesus didn't go to the cross for it to be useless. He went there to the cross to pay for our sins, to provide the way of salvation. But the only way possible for us to be saved from our sins is to be obedient to Him. This morning, it may be the case that you're not a child of God, that you've never been saved from your sins. We want to plead with you today to do what is necessary. We find out what's necessary in the Word of God. The Bible tells us that we're to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 3, verse 16. It tells us that we're to repent of our sins, Luke 13 and verse 3. It goes on to let us know that we're to make the great confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God as the eunuch did, Acts 8, verse 37. Then it also tells us that we're to be baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2 and verse 38, so that those sins can be washed away, Acts 22, verse 16. Perhaps you've done those things, but perhaps you realize today that you aren't as faithful as you once were. And you're ready this morning through repentance and prayer to make your life right. So that you can say, I know just how important salvation is. We're going to sing the song in just one moment. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. Don't let it be too late. If you need to make things right this morning, why won't you come as together we stand and ask.